Valerie Pruitt had asked me, do you think the real estate market is going to decline similar to 2008? And that's a pretty darn big question. Nobody really knows exactly what's going to happen in simple answers, but I want to share a little bit of things that I consider in my answer to this question. So I love Ryan Lindquist locally here with the SacramentoAppraisalBlog.com. He's got a ton of information. Please check him out. So looking over here at the first graph on the left, we see what the market has done for the county median price since 1990. If you look at it, you'll see like 1990, 91, all the way almost through 98, we have a slight decline, very little bit. And then we go up, 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 all the way up there through what, 2006, 2007. And so this is the big question she's asking. You see this huge dump, right? From about 2008 all the way through roughly 2012, we're pretty much down there at bottom. And then we go up, 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 all the way up to about, I don't know, 2021, late 2022. And here we come down. And the question is, following forward, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but following, is it going to continue and have this big trough like we had before? That's the question that I'm here to answer. Looking over at the right, this is a slide that Jeff Marr provided to Donna, betting against the champ. And this is from Case Schiller, S&P. And this is, I don't know, a certain number of markets in the U.S. Um, that they did change in home values since 1941. If you look at it, you'll see that from 42 all the way up to 55, values um, on average went up, 1955, zero. And then you move on, and we don't see any drop until 90 and 91 for a couple of years. And then again, positive on the real estate until we hit this 2007, 2011 period. We had about five down years. And then since then, everything's gone up. I want to mention, having been in the lending industry for 36 years, prior to 2007, probably about five years just prior to that, we had a huge period of creative financing. And when we hit 2007, we had a lot of loans on the books that were not good. And we had what I call an atypical seller, uh, which are the banks. The banks needed to get their poor assets off the books. And I think that's a large reason why we had such a huge drop. Um, they do things that a typical seller would not do, in my opinion. Some more from Ryan. Uh, here, <clears throat> I'm looking at housing affordability on the left-hand side. And he goes all there where from 2006, you see we jump up um, as far as affordability goes right after that crash started. 2007, prices come down. Homes became way more affordable. We're all the way up there around 70% here in Sacramento. And then we steadily come down as prices go up. And if you remember that chart, 2012 is when we really started the end our down years. And naturally, affordability went down. And it's gone down, 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 all the way down here to about 28%, similar to where we were in 2006. But I want to consider this. Look over on the right-hand side. This is the median sales price in the Sacramento area. And you'll see the yellow line here at the bottom is 2018. The blue line is 2019. 2020, when that pandemic hits, you notice we start to gap away and go up in prices. 2021, that yellow line, we surely gap up hugely. And then 2022, still continuing that gap, and if we recall, the Fed started raising rates about January or February of that year. And you'll see right around June, July, we start to come down as the impact of those rates take hold in the market. And here you have 2023, the black line, where we go down and we're starting to move up. Before we change slides, my initial instinct is to look at this and go, oh my God, look how far up we've come. And look at where our affordability is, 28%. My instincts is to want to tell you prices need to come down 
because we have a large affordability price uh, issue with the raise in prices and the raise in interest rates. However, there are some other things to consider. In 2007, on a nationwide basis, we had 4 million listings. Today, look at the steady decline. We have less than a million listings in 2023. So inventory is way down. <clears throat> I take this from the Sacramento Council, Area Council of Governments, and they were doing an analysis on what's going on in our area in the Sacramento region. <laughs> By 2040, we expect to add at least 620,000 people. And this is the historic and projected annual housing construction. And if you look there, you'll see that since 2009, construction has dropped way off. For this entire decade, for over 10 years, what, 13, 14 years now, we have a huge construction gap, which means very, very limited inventory. This is taken from a gentleman named Kai McBride, who's an authority in my business, and he's talking about population growth. So we look over here at the baby boomers and Gen X, we have roughly 130,000. And if we look over at the Gen Z and millennials, we have roughly 170,000. It's a huge gap in population, which means we've got growth coming for people that want and need to purchase homes of about at least 35 million. In addition, he pointed out that boomers don't tend to move. The Gen X tends to hold their properties for rentals. Jumping down here to corporate buyouts, a lot of corporations are buying properties for um, investment and holding those properties. We have a lot of late millennial buyers to the market, and we've got new Gen Z buyers. We have huge population growth, growth which creates big demand for real estate. So, in short, for all these reasons, due to uh, severely limited inventory with historically low housing construction rates, continued population growth, and new standards of lending implemented in 2010, and not all the bad loans we had before, I personally do not think we will see a similar decline as in 2008 at all. So that's my opinion. All right, I'm going to move forward so we don't take too much time. Are you working with clients who are then renting out the property from Karen Ramos? Yeah, occasionally. Doesn't happen that often. Most people wind up selling and buying another one, but occasionally I do have potential um, people that uh, rent out their properties. Can I do mobile homes from Donna Hertel? No, I can do manufactured properties on a permanent foundation. Stephanie asked, how far in advance should someone start working with you? I recommend checking in at least six months in advance. And if they have not purchased before or are concerned about any of these three areas, length of time on job and earnings, their credit, the money that they need, then one year would be a good idea. There's no cost for an initial consultation. And I want to build a relationship with my potential customers well in advance of their need. <clears throat> Can I lend in other states? I'm licensed in California. I also have my license for Nevada, but I'm waiting for my branch approval. So more to follow on that. My company is licensed in all 49 states except New York, and I can re refer customers within my company for assistance. How did I get started doing videos from Jeff Marr? So initially a little trial and error, and then I hired Ginger Bell with in Edu Marketing for training and assistance. She provides a lot of great content. And then I also learned reels from Neil Dingra with Forward Academy. Uh, see, Jeff Sinclair asked, how do I advise people on how much home they can afford and what dollars to put down? Another big question. I normally ask folks two questions during the process to gauge where they are mentally so that I'm aware before I answer their questions. I want to be mindful of where their mindset and expectations are before blurting out information that may be way off from what they're thinking. So I'm going to ask them what price range they're thinking of purchasing in and how much they think they can afford to pay per month for a home that they'd fall in love with. 
So we'll have a discussion around that and what their qualifications actually look like. Typically, lenders call for a housing ratio around 33%, which is 33% of their gross income goes towards the total house payment, principal interest, property taxes, insurance, the whole bit. Most buyers exceed that guideline, and I've seen them go up to as high as 43% and some even higher than that. The second thing that lenders look at is a total debt to income ratio, which is the total house payment and including their monthly recurring, recurring debt payments that would show up on their credit report. So car payments, credit cards, we look at minimum monthly payments and we add in if they've got alimony or child support or something out of the norm, like maybe a tax lien, we've got to consider that as well. That total amount needs to be less than 50% of their gross income for conventional loans. And then sometimes it'll be limited to 45. Government loans, I've seen them go as high as 55%. Jumbo loans are a little more strict, which is a loan amount above 763,600 now here in California in our area. So they'll typically limit that to a 43% total ratio. And most first-time buyers often will limit us to 45, some go to 50. So often home buyers, most of the time, nearly always are pushing their qualifying limits. And it becomes a matter of how much they can qualify for maximum. Personally, I think the ideal guideline would be a 33 housing ratio over a 40 total debt to income. But it also depends on their job and lifestyle. If they're expecting raises and are solid on their job, they've got reserves and they're not anticipating any heavy expenses coming up, then higher ratios may make more sense. If they're in a job with less upward income potential, don't have a lot of reserves, or they're self-employed with variable income, then being more conservative would make more sense. It's really more of an art rather than a science. And for Jeff as a financial advisor, you are more likely in a position to influence those customers than I am on what may be best for them to plan for their future. Too often in my camp, borrowers are simply trying to get in and afford as much as possible to get the home that they want. And I'm requested to support them in that endeavor for qualifying as much as is possible. Bill Page had asked, is buying extra property hard for people to be approved? Not if you're buying a primary residence. However, if you are purchasing an investment property, there are larger down payment requirements, larger cash reserves required, and tighter credit standards. Christy asked, are there still programs for ADUs? The most popular program I'm aware of is an ADU grant program through the state of California. <clears throat> Those funds have been fully reserved as of March of this year. However, I want you to know there are financing options that will allow ADUs. And for Fannie Mae, they're allowed with a primary one unit dwelling. Two to four units are not eligible. Freddie Mac will allow an ADU for one to three unit properties. And Freddie also has a renovation loan through Freddie Mac that allows ADU for one to three unit properties also. However, there are specific guidelines surrounding ADUs and comparable requirements from appraisers that may be difficult to get, especially if you're using a Freddie Mac program. And those are the questions I was asked. Anybody have questions about what I talked about? I do real quick on the ADUs. Um, one of my coworkers is interested in building one. Can you mm -hmm. do the loan for that or at least keep an ear out for ADUs to see if you can help them when, when the time Yeah, the so time? if they're really interested, I mean, we can look at, there's something called the Homestyle Renovation Loan, that's Fannie Mae um, and Freddie Mac. So they could potentially assist with building they're not okay. going to offer a grant that was through the state of California. Uh, okay. But if That's they're really interested, I'd be more than happy to do the homework on that. Okay. So you can help with a loan, but not for the grant program has all been funded already. Correct. Okay. I'll let her know. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Any other questions? Back to the um, requirements, primary residence versus investment properties, investment properties, higher requirements um, or more strict. Is that also the same for vacation property or does vacation kind of fall under primary residence? So like second home, I'm going to say it kind of falls in between the two. Okay. Yeah, it's it's not quite as strict as quote unquote an investment property, but the guidelines are they're you know not the same as a primary residence. You can get a little bit higher loan to value, um, so it's doable. I mean, when I say higher loan to value, I mean less money down for a secondary home than is going to necessarily be required on an investment property, but they're going to require a little bit more down than your primary residence. Uh, Mark, there's a little comment in chat from Eric saying, hi, Mark, I have a customer building an ADU in Sacramento. I see him Monday. I'll talk to him about financing. Okay, great. Cool. Can you, Any other talk, thoughts? Can you talk a little bit about loans um, when you buy land? Buy to build, essentially, land and building. Land and Question. build. So often if you're just buying land, let's say you're not buying to build it, um, that would be a land loan. Usually you've got to come in with a lot more down. Um, if you're doing it for a construction, um, some of the construction packages will do like an all-in-one where you're purchasing the land, um, you're going to have higher down payment requirements when you're going to be building something. Usually they'll require about 25% in. Um, so it's doable, but you've got to be a much more solid candidate because that property is going to be collateral for the lender's loan. And the improvement really is what's key. And if that's not there. We've got to get all our bids in place from the construction people we need to sheet cash reserves, <laughs> et cetera, make sure that deal's going to get done. Okay. And also, I would comment to check with the counties on their permits and how much they cost <laughs> and what you are allowed to do. <laughs> Absolutely. You yes. guys are talking about everything I do. <laughs> I love it. It's like, Eric's what like me ooh, these ooh, people? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Long packages. <laughs> Des so design much, packages. <laughs> Go, sorry, <laughs> I'm talking over. Go ahead, please. Um, so how much of plans do you need in place, like building plans and permit plans do you need in place <laughs> to be able to get a loan? Do you need to have it like already everything in mind and designs or... Yeah, to go through that process, you're going to wind okay. up needing to have those, right? Because those all have got to go into <laughs> the appraiser, right? So that's a big <laughs> holdup in the process right there. Most folks have this idea and it's happened to me. So I'll be honest, I don't do construction all the time, although I get you know asked about it. I did last year and like, okay, well, you need to talk with your contractor and you need to get a bid on how much this is going to cost. And what they, the customers think, and they're pretty savvy people, right? They're smart, but what a lot of them think it's going to cost. And then after they talk to their contractor, the story changes. And I've had this happen numerous times where they get that bid and they go, um, we're going to go a different direction. <laughs> Right, because it's a hundred to two hundred to three hundred thousand more than they anticipated in cost. Does that sound correct to you, Eric? Um, I caution them, and when I do a design where we when we agree with the design, I run um, some perfect uh, construction numbers based upon the um, uh, zip code, and that is the proof of like, okay, caution, either stop or redesign and lower the expectations and lower the design process. So it usually works out. I need to probably work with you more, Eric, <laughs> or have customers work with you so we can get them in line. I wind up, you know, running numbers I, for them. And when they get that big surprise, the numbers are too much. 
often. I, I try to scare people first before they get too deep into it and talk about the realities of Sacramento County and Placer County and El Dorado County and get them aligned and give them some That's numbers good. and give them some it, it helps them with the entire pre-planning process. Sometimes I might spend a whole hour with um, a customer. Um, I don't get paid for it, but then, or potential, but then they go, ah, oh, it's, they come away a lot stronger and usually, well, they come back and say, we do want to do this. Thank you for spending some time with us. It was very, very um, illuminating and we think we either want to go with a different route or we want to do a room addition or something like that. It's educating yeah. them and giving them, you know, real numbers <sighs> to work with so yes. they don't get their heart set on it and have it crash. <laughs> heartbreaking. People's people's eyes are always bigger. <laughs> the design is always bigger than their budget. <laughs> Sorry, well, Mark, I'm taking away your time. Go ahead. No, no, no. This is great. It, it helps to answer the question. Um, because once we can get in line with that, um, I'm going to say my company and our company, because Jeff Mar now works for the same company as me, um, American Pacific Mortgage has a construction division and a renovation division. Um, I've worked mostly with the renovation and occasionally the construction, and they have people that, that are mm-hmm. experts in doing that. And they will jump in. They'll let me handle the credit piece and the qualifying, mm. but they will jump in because there's extra steps when you're going to do construction and you're going to do renovation. And they're literally, I've, I've done them. Like they'll do a three-way, four-way call, get everybody on there, do them a Zoom meeting and really walk both in some cases, the contractor and or realtor and the customer through the process on the on the contracting steps and what needs to be done mm. with those designs and et cetera. Um, and it's super helpful to me. So and the title 24 and the structural engineering and the site plan and <laughs> the survey and the services. Yeah, and on we go. Uh, and all the other and headings. Mark, you do land loans and construction loans? I do not do land loans. Okay. Um, I can jump in on the construction piece. Um, but, you know, I'm going to be honest. Is that something I do every day? No. Um, I'll jump in and do the work to help you. We used to have banks in the area, like Umqua <laughs> Bank was a big one that really specialized in construction. They're not here anymore. The market's changed. So you'll need someone like me to do that homework which, you know, different times bring different practices. I'm happy to jump in and get my team involved and help out. So I do land loans, but we really don't do land loans. That's very complicated. But so if you do a land loan, we are not a land bank, which means you can't go buy real estate and not develop it. Uh, because in a recession, that land goes to pretty much zero. So we require a huge amount of money down, sometimes 50% minimum, 75% a lot of times, but it's really for a developer who's going to develop it. But that development, you want to have that land price as their injection for a commercial property or a five unit apartment complex or a hotel or whatever that is. So usually that's the the purchase to get the loan for that on the commercial side. But a lot of times I'll even get questions on, you know, 40 acres and they have a single family residence on it and it's too big for, you know, there's agriculture and there's agriculture revenue. So commercial banks always look at the revenue that can be provided or generated from the property. Um, it's just complicated, but, you know, once I talk to them, they, they usually have a better understanding. Mark, this is Rosemary. <clears throat> you know, I shared on the, um, uh, the chat that in 08, when I was doing a lot of consulting uh, with and coaching, clients um who had been displaced from from jobs um w- would come in and we'd, we'd start to work uh together and one of the first things they said was 
I just bought a house. I just purchased a house. And now I'm finding out that I no longer have, have a job. Um, <clears throat> so that job security piece in ter terms of loan qualifying is it, it, huge. And, and I, I couldn't help think, well, I, I know that's got to be taken into account. You know, job security anymore is, isn't what we used to think of, I think, in, in previous years, that it's pretty tenuous, you know, that sometimes it can be, it can really be tough to know how secure a, a job is. I think there's some, in fact, I know there's some industries that are probably more, more prone to uh, things like downsizing or, you know, kind of miscalculating, you know, how much staff they're going to, going to need. But, um, uh, that's a, uh, I guess that's, that's just sort of an area that's, that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Yeah. So I'll comment on that back in 2007, 2008 in the lending financial world, we had a house of cards and we had a huge, when I say a house of cards, we had a ton of, um, poorly financed homes that would have payments jump up significantly within one to two years. And mm -hmm. the abundance of those loans in the marketplace, along with um, job layoffs, divorces, and all the normal things that happen as the economy turns down, um, exacerbated the problem that was happening. And I want to point out, which I mentioned most clearly, is that we had an atypical seller. We had so many bad loans on the books the banks had to deal with what's called asset liability management, which means they needed to get their poor performing loans off their books. They tried to do loan modifications, everything they could to mitigate their risk and appease their investors. And so what happened is real estate went on sale for five years. I literally wrote about this, but it's one of the times, rare times I was like 100% accurate. I wrote it in a newsletter back then. I drew out the graph for them and I told them this is going to go on until about 2012 because I knew that the majority of loans would be reset by that time. And so I was like, you know what? Get your foreclosure, get your stuff done, get it over with and come back in and buy when the market is down roughly 2012. I, I drew the bell curve for them, knew it was going to happen this time around we don't have that atypical seller because we don't have all those poor performing loans on the books. You might have some people that go into foreclosure because they got laid off of their job or whatever, but it's nowhere near the numbers of 2008, nowhere near those type of loan programs. And with the huge limited inventory and the equity that we've seen, because we went upside down back in 2008, when the banks dropped their prices, people went upside down in their equity. I don't see that happening today. So people that maybe lose their jobs and they can't afford their home, they get with a realtor like Donna Hertel there and they sell it at a great price. And, That's and what you, I see happening. Yeah. No, you, you, you make an excellent, excellent point. And, and I think that's why when, um, a few of the, you know, Blue Ribbon members have, have said, hey, you know, we know some people who think maybe um, job losses in their future. I, I think also people have become more attuned to, to that uh, because that was one of the questions, particularly in that time frame in, 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 in 08, you know, did, did you see it coming, you, you, you know? And, and at that time, and you're absolutely right, Mark, it, it would literally just come out of the blue. But I think, uh, and, and, and as a coach, that's one of those kind of preemptive strikes is just, just don't take it for granted. Don't think everything is going to you know, continue the way, the way it does. And, 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 uh, if you've got some, you know, anxiety about it, you know, act on that and start to start to set some things um, in motion. And it's interesting too, from from kind of my side of of uh, what I I do and and business whatever. And, and I know many people tend to view it as kind of the soft side of, of business, when in fact 
for those people who came to me, those clients who, who came and, and I was part of a firm at that time, not, not doing it individually, um, that clearly pre presented some sense of urgency. You know, I just bought this house. You, you know, I, I need a new job stat kind, kind of thing. Um, and, and you, you work, you go through all the steps, but it's at an accelerated pace. So it's, it's basically getting people back on their feet as quickly as, as possible, but, but it takes a strategy and it takes, um, you, you know, thought, uh, thought and, it, and it takes a process. And I think that's where, uh, what I was doing as a consultant and now do as a coach, it kicks in, you know, it doesn't just happen. You gotta, you gotta work at it. And I will say this just on a personal side, um, 08, well, no, I'm sorry, it was actually 2010 when, no, I'm sorry, it was, it was actually 07 when uh, my older son, um, now wife, but it was then girlfriend, were relocated to California because of a job. And those conditions were advantageous to them as that um, not really millennial, just kind of, he's on, kind of on the cusp of it. Um, really had a, had a just unbelievable real estate opportunity to get into a, a beautiful home and, and it all worked toward in, in their favor. So I, I, I totally remember that time frame as far as real estate was concerned. 